Yeah, we're back. We're going to talk about Myanmar, and we're going to talk about Southeast Asia. We're going to talk about the Chinese Coast Guard versus the Philippines Coast Guard. We have a lot to discuss on our plate with independent journalist uh, Chris Cottrell, who who joins us from I'm not sure where, uh, somewhere in South Los Angeles. Los Angeles. That's well, that's kind of East Southeast Asia. I just got back from South Thailand. Yeah, (laughs) we'll be right back for the detail. Welcome to the show, Chris. So nice to have you here. We want to catch up. Me, we want to catch up, uh, you know, from our discussion in Singapore not too long ago, um, and just uh, review what's going on in the South China Sea, which is not too far from Singapore, um, yep. and within these altercations between the Philippine Coast Guard and the Chinese Coast Guard, which appear to be all the more threatening. Can you talk about it? Yeah, sure. Um, in the first two months of this year, Jay, I had the uh, great opportunity to travel by ship. Um, from Luzon to Mindoro to all the way down to Palawan Island and ask lots of local folks and um, fishermen, resort people, uh, Philippines Coast Guard um, workers, as well as uh, a lot of the top brass and spokespeople off record about how they were viewing these uh, continued ships. And I think the most um, from China on their shores, which they call the militia ships off their coast. And the response I got from the Philippines Coast Guard was quite revealing. Said, this isn't new. Um, under Duterte, we just kept it quiet. We didn't really talk about it. We went through back channels. Whereas the current administration under Marcos Jr. is, we will report everything we see. And in fact, the Philippines Coast Guard said, if you're harassed, put it on your Facebook account. Show us. Show the world, really, the true face of what's going on. That's why you've seen laser flashes pointed at Filipino ships. And of the three major collisions this year between the Philippines Coast Guard and Chinese Coast Guard, where they're just like really about about two of them were boat incidents. I think one in uh, late February, early March, and one just recently in April, and a plane. All of them involved um, Filipino journalists aboard those vessels. And so whether they how they knew that they were there, I don't I don't understand. But it was very close. And even the Chinese Foreign Ministry mentioned, well, you had journalists aboard your vessels, and you're just trying to create an international incident. Whereas the Philippines government is trying to be far more transparent with its local press, which is different from the Duterte administration. I think Marcus administration is far more proactive in allowing their foreign or their local journalists on the ships. As a foreign journalist, I can't come on for security reasons. I know I tried for two months and tried desperately. <laughs> they wouldn't let me on. They're very polite about it. But still, uh, that that is the crisis point you're looking at is um, as U.S. and Philippines get closer in terms of uh, all sorts of bilateral trade issues, and security issues, there seems to be a bit more Beijing brinksmanship, if you will. Yeah, how is this affected by the mutual defense agreement? Um, it's uh, it hasn't harmed it. In fact, it seems to be um, having a new cycle enhancement of it, if you will, where Filipino local folks and government officials who might be you know weary of having U.S. military presence from historical um, um, issues, more or less, are proactive in this. It's, oh, you're reinforcing our bases. And you're not using this as a way to defend Taiwan. Marcos even said, uh, that's not the case here. And we're really looking at our own independent sovereignty and defense in these cases. And we welcome U.S. um, training and um, interoperability, um, uh, construction, etc. He even visited the Pentagon, which was, uh, I think, the first time a foreign president has done that in recent history, um, and was well received. So Marcos Jr., has a rising role within ASEAN, not all welcome maybe the way he's doing it, but it is it is there. And so in a multipolar world, you're seeing actors across ASEAN rising up. And I think that's the ultimate thing to look at in the coming months and the, for the rest of these years, how Philippines and other actors in ASEAN are increasing their global presence. And everyone's coming to see them from Washington to Brussels and London and Beijing too. Well, you know, uh, this is really a territorial dispute where uh, the Philippines uh, claim certain areas in South China Sea, and and China says, no, that belongs to us, and we are mm, occupying it in various military ways. Um, And, um, you know, I mean, I I would tend to side with the Philippines on that. But in fact, there are a number of countries that do not support the Philippines' position. Um, And uh, maybe that's a geopolitical consideration. Maybe it's a. and based on some 
rule of um, international territoriality. Well, who, who is with the Philippines and who is not? Uh, well, the United States is clearly with the Philippines on this. The um, State Department has been very clear that any um, encroachment um, on Philippines ships could enact a mutual defense treaty. Um, across ASEAN, uh, you have some cooler cooler heads that um, look at Beijing a bit more objectively. They want basically business with China and will be a bit quieter on this issue. But maybe back channels are saying, you know, ease up a bit on the um, on the rhetoric, if you will. Whereas Beijing, their position is this. It's the nine dash line. This is our territory. You are in our territory. And you're working with um, other foreign operatives that um, we view as aggressors in our territory. This is the Beijing perspective. Um, it's not going away. They're not mm. looking at the, uh, the Hague ruling from a few years ago the same way that others recognize the Hague ruling. So th this is the greater tension. But listening to Beijing's position on this um, we, it, is pretty important. You have to understand how they're going to come to the table with this and what might be um, asked later at negotiation tables. But uh, they don't seem to want to negotiate anything on this. Yeah, that's interesting about the Hague ruling. The Hague ruling would make the Philippine government correct. Its claim to this area would be confirmed by the Hague ruling. And the Chinese completely deny and uh, disregard that ruling. That's um, correct. Why isn't that part of the conversation? Or uh, put it this way, why isn't it a larger part of the conversation? I'm not sure why it's not a larger part of the conversation, whereas because uh, it was a ruling against Beijing, they didn't like it. Um, in fact, I think their answer is clear. They built a hot pot restaurant on one of the reclaimed islands. I think <laughs> I, I, I had over 100 of their ships off the, uh, you know, Palawan. So when you're looking at from that perspective, they're not going to listen. Yeah. Interesting. So, um, you know, uh, my my reading of the articles about these uh, uh, uh what do you want to call it? The near near misses in the, the near misses, yeah. um, is that it's dangerous business. You know, you're at sea and you're fifty yards away from the other guy. Um, you could have a collision so easily, um, and if you have a collision, people will die, ships will sink. This is very dangerous business. Who is better prepared to take that loss? Uh, no one's prepared to take that sort of loss. Uh, Inside of the Philippines, if a ship sinks, it would galvanize nationalism. Um, the Philippines is very socially media active. Their, their social media stream is not censored. It's whatever they feel and whatever they say. That's quite contrary to the zeitgeist within um, mainland China, where they can control the conversations, where TikTok accounts or other social media accounts can be blocked, et cetera, um, with trigger words and images immediately yanked. So that, that's the primary difference here. And when the Filipinos are um, as nationalistic as they are now to a person, I think it's very hard to change that um, if you're Beijing and trying to engage the Philippines to do other things when you just can't control the conversation anymore. And part, of the news, part of the news, Chris, is, uh, is photographs of the um, Philippine, Filipino ships, uh, Filipino Coast Guard ships, and they look so much like American Coast Guard ships. We've got a color scheme, uh, stripes in the front, all that. Only difference is it says uh, Philippines Coast Guard on the side. Um, but, you know, what you get, what I get, is these must be ships that either were um, American ships before or were designed by American designers uh, and possibly armed in the same way an American Coast Guard ship would be armed. In other words, they have the, the full faith and credit of the United States in building and operating these ships that look so much like American ships. Is that true? Um, some of those ships um, have been donated by the United States before and rekitted and, and upgraded. And a lot of their training is with the U.S. Coast Guard, which um, and they also train with Australian Coast Guard. Um, and they're doing more bilateral training with Coast Guards from Japan. South Korea is talking to them. Uh, and that's come out of the last five months of some of these standoffs. When I spoke with the Coast Guard, they need more ships they need more personnel they need more infrastructure for berths they need more radar and sonar i think japan's providing uh, of the major link ups um half are provided by japan and those expire at the end of this year so they really are um need of greater equipment well you know it just strikes me too that china is beefing up its um its navy 
um, in so many ways and spending a lot of money. And if it, if there really uh, came a time when they would have a physical contention at sea, um, the Chinese could blow them out of the water in 10 minutes, 10 seconds. <laughs> Isn't That's that the general consensus is it, it really is uh, David and Goliath. There, there is no match. Neither side wants that. Uh, I, I don't think Beijing wants to have any kind of serious conflict, but they would be um, prepared for it. And um, I don't think the Philippines either want that either. No one wants to see ships co colliding and crashing and creating proxy conflicts. Something that you would say, Ken, would be to, like the Gulf of Tonkin crisis. Can you take this to, to a, a larger a larger level here, uh, you know, in the connection with ASEAN, what ASEAN could and should do about it, and what other issues are on ASEAN's plate these days, uh, aside from the South China Sea. Okay. Um, you know, how just exactly how are we doing in Southeast Asia these days? Okay. Um, it's great that you mentioned ASEAN meeting because their meeting is going on in Indonesia right now, the uh, 10 countries. And shadowing that uh, is Chinese vessels off the coast of Vietnam with as ASEAN and India hold their own maritime exercises, they're feeling shadowed too. And this took place in Vietnam's exclusive economic zone. So that's a conversation being had on the island of Flores right now as ASEAN's meeting. Um, Indonesia's chairing ASEAN here. So they're going to have to talk about these issues. But of their top agendas for security in the region, Myanmar is number one. And that might be a segue into Myanmar. But again, South China Sea is very difficult to discuss. <laughs> Uh, within ASEAN because different players have different ideas, and certainly Beijing will not stop um, viewing the nine-dash line as their nine-dash line. That's not going back in the box. Yeah, uh, what I get is that, um, you know, the, the things do not happen in a vacuum. And while ASEAN may be meeting um, China, and for that matter, the Philippines, is trying to lobby the members of ASEAN to side with their respective positions. Um, that and, why, and while there are no ships actually colliding, am I right? And while um, there's nobody, no ships are uh, being sunk or uh, sailors uh, being killed, no. um, the fact is in Myanmar, we have violence. We have, we have all kinds of outrageous violations of uh, human rights and the like. People are being killed wholesale for no good reason. Um, and ASEAN should be, should be more concerned about that. So what is ASEAN doing? What can it do about Myanmar? Um, that's a critical um, discussion point taking place in Flores Island right now with this summit. Now, in 2021, they agreed on the five-point consensus, right? And of those um, first two points, number one is cease ceasefire. And that's very difficult to do when you have a variety of different actors. Um, the current junta has been um, doing sweep and clear operations. You've seen airstrikes. You've seen um, shootings in villages. And you've seen retaliation. I think just a day ago, there was a shooting of Singapore and Indonesian diplomats in Shan State as they were delivering aid, which is point four of the five point um, consensus. So they're delivering aid. And so the Singapore government and Indonesian government have had to issue stern words to Napida about attacks on them. Uh, I think the Myanmar response was, oh, there were some rebels that were shot at us, so we were shooting back at them. This seems to be a spurious case of why would rebels be shooting at aid co convoys? Um, they wouldn't, right? It just, just seems uh, it, it doesn't wash with me, really. And I don't think it washes with anyone who's really closely trying to watch this. As I've been watching it for the past two years, when the coup happened and I was living um, two hours from the border with Myanmar and Thailand, and who I continue to talk with refugees and local folks um, about this crisis, that, that informs my understanding of the current um, Crisis, but ASEAN has got all partners um, and all parties on the backside discussing stop the violence, including the National Unity Government, which has had accusations of using child soldiers. Um, maybe certain militias have gone a bit far, but also if you're a 14 or 15 year old and your village was attacked and you're angry, you're going to want to grab a gun. And so mitigating that kind of a uh, frustration, making sure that soldiers and militias don't have teenagers or children in them is something the um, National Unity Governor, NUG, um, has made a point to do. At least they've announced that. But uh, that doesn't seem to really wash with Napidaw's thinkers, and they just continue to uh, continue to conduct the headlines that we see. Well, they uh, they seem to be using the uh, Myanmar junta is being used, is using uh, air bombs 
which yeah. are um, a weapon of mass destruction, a weapon, a, a, an atrocity weapon, probably considered a war crime weapon. Um, and, uh, you know, it's been in the news, um, it's in all the news channels, because it's so, it's so outrageous. And yet, um, what do you do about that? You know, this is, what I get is um, ASEAN can bring the parties together, they can talk, they can um, talk about how this is wrong. But what can they do? There are no blue helmets in ASEAN. Um, there's no force. There's no, not even a sanctions program that could have any effect whatsoever to the Myanmar junta. So it continues to happen, and it gets worse and more atrocious. Um, what can be done here? Is the United Nations involved? Could the United Nations be involved? Well, I would hope ASEAN would reach out to its um, regional neighbor within the UN Security Council, which is Beijing who does have constructive dialogue, who does conduct regular meetings with uh, NAPIDOM and can, in some ways, um, rein them in a bit, but not fully. I mean, this isn't a 70-year civil war, if you want to view it like that. Um, if you, you can't arm, it necessarily, in my estimation, um, too many groups because um, you don't know where the weapons go. Mm. And so um, the Tatmadaw is very strong. This isn't a scenario where the uh, Gorillas move in and they are walked away. They would become the gorillas. And this would continue um, an ongoing crisis of refugees that is affecting Thailand, um, Laos to a degree, but certainly um, Bangladesh and India too, and China. So these regional powers, especially Beijing and New Delhi, I think can really weigh in more with Napi. Uh, China's building a pipeline from Yunnan to the Bay of Bengal and is trying to build infrastructure that will maybe find other ways to create economic stability. And despite uh, certain viewpoints that this is effective or not, Beijing needs to be engaged from ASEAN. And I think that conversation is going on. But what that looks like and what is the end game, I'm very unclear. No one is clear on this. Well, I guess there are two questions that, that linger for me. One is why 70, 70 years of civil war? Um, that is so counterproductive. I mean, it, certainly, it stands in the way of any progress. It stands in the way of security, of economics, of um, global relationships with the country. Um, wh why is that happening? Um, wh wh how do people feel about that in Myanmar? Um, what justifies the continuation of these, of these um, atrocities? It comes out of Brit British post-colonialism, where you have the majority ethnic group, the Bamar, Burmese, um, in the central, um, dominating the administration and a lot of the resources and the outlying areas, which are different ethnic groups. So these ethnic armed conflicts um, are at the heart of this. But unlike previous, I think, <laughs> ethnic conflicts, the Bamar are on the sides of the ethnic groups this time and against the centralized junta. So a lot of the uh, refugees who are university age that I spoke to in Bangkok and the Gulf of Thailand who are working in hospitality, uh, their opinion is, we don't see the U.S. helping us. We are unsure. We should be learning Chinese. And I said, well, you should learn Chinese because they're your neighbors and you should be able to discuss with them, et cetera. Uh, but why won't we give them guns like we give Ukraine? I said, well, it's a very different situation. I don't think those, those two conflicts need to be, um, should be compared, but that's how they, how they view it. Um, again, the, the deep ethnic conflicts underpin the current problems. But uh, I really need to spend more time in Myanmar. And unfortunately, as any journalist can tell you, you cannot go in. Well, maybe you don't want to go in with this level of violence. You know? But the, the, thing, the thing that I get is that if you have this sort of civil war and continuing violence and disruption of any you know, constructive governmental process, any constructive economic process, um, it, it has to have an effect on your neighbors. Um, and your neighbors, A, you know, would say, gee whiz, this is not good for us to have it on our border. And B, um, they can say, well, maybe there are people in my country that will repeat the same sort of atrocity here. So I have to be concerned that, you know, about the possibility that it, it will spread to certain groups in my country. Is this the case in Southeast Asia? You will certainly see what with the Rohingya um, in the Northwest who are flooding into Bangladesh and India, and they have for the last several, like, since 2017, 18, when a lot of these uh, genocide atrocities were taking place. Uh, both Dhaka and New Delhi, they want to repatriate a lot of these refugees back and they want to find corridors. So the, the last thing they want is fresh conflict. Um, China does not want um, gunfire on the border of Yunnan whatsoever. 
And they are, they've even conducted with a new foreign minister, Qing Gong, visited, I think, the border city of Wanding. He said, one village, two countries, which sounds like one country, two systems to me. <laughs> Very Beijing flavored way of looking at that. They do not want, they've taken in refugees before and they said, hand over your guns. And they've also repatriated others um, who wanted to organize armed conflict out of China, which is not going to happen. You won't see China as a base for that overtly. Thailand has a lot of refugees who are being uh, working in plantations and factories. Sadly, lots of human trafficking is going on. And uh, I've met university age kids who I thought, you would be in law school right now. And this one said, guy said, yeah, I, I, I fled after the conflict. I got on a plane and I've been living here and I work in a bar and I'd like to go back to law school. And I what thought, yeah, yeah, it, it really is a lost generation. I don't know if I answered your question or not, but uh, the border countries um, of engagement, Thailand is taking the brunt really because it's more of an open country and there's a lot more kind of opportunities or risks, if you will. Um, it's easier for Bamar, English speaking kids to go in and work in Thailand that is, is for them to blend in into India or Bangladesh. And you know, so <clears throat> the, uh, I don't know why, but I think of Cambodia and all of the accountability issues around what happened in Cambodia. And I, and I see this as, uh, you know, a reckless murder, mass killing. Uh, I see this as unjustified um, war crimes, if you will. Is there any, is there any uh, effort at accountability happening here? And if not, is, is, is there any discussion about whether it will happen in the future? Um, there are folks who are advocating for war crimes, um, tribunals and investigations, and human rights groups are chronicling um, atrocities against villagers, um, sort of massacres, all kinds of things. Are But it's not raised, I think, so far at the UN for officially trying the current Tatmada on war crimes. And I think if it were, uh, Moscow and Beijing would veto it. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Why am I not surprised with that? Well, so that you talk about journalism, and you you want to follow this. You want to know everything that's going on. You you I, want to have your re, your sources, and uh, you want to be there on the ground if you can. But that's pretty risky business, you know. Southeast Asia is not a um, uh, a bed of roses, and. Uh, in order to get around and be a journalist, uh, I, I wonder how you inform yourself. I wonder what your who your sources are. Don't name them. Uh, who your sources are, and, and how you get into the country and the fabric of the society, the community, um, so that you can say with some authority, um, you know what what is going on here and what will go on. For reading ASEAN, you need to be in Bangkok. This is why I spent a lot of time in Thailand. It has a very strong ASEAN brain, if you will, a lot of international um, UN is there. The um, Foreign Correspondents Club of Thailand recently had the Thai government's position on how this harms Thailand. Uh, if you look at the Foreign Correspondents Club of Thailand, there's a, a video of that discussion, recent discussion. Any tourist who comes into Thailand and is talking with an English-speaking waitstaff, they're likely from Burma. And within a few minutes, you can start having the conversation of, what was it like to be displaced? Why did you leave? What would you want? How would you want to go home? Yeah, these are easy conversations to have for anyone really inside of Thailand. I don't mm -hmm. see tourists going to refugee camps in Bangladesh, though, or India, which need a bit more. Um, Indian journalists and Bangladeshi journalists are reporting on this. And so it's quite good reporting from outside. But going inside, you will be arrested. They're aware of who comes in. You will go to jail. Your equipment will be seized. Uh, there was a Japanese journalist who was shot to death um, covering some of the riots in 2007. And they just recovered his camera. And the, the Japanese government is still trying to get his camera back to see what were his last, um, the last pictures he took. So it, it's well aware that foreign journalists are not welcomed by the Tatmada at all. And so getting information, refugees and human rights groups are ferreting out small videos made on iPhones and they're putting them on the internet. And that's that's where we are with this. Again, if you're a foreign correspondent, you can learn a lot in Bangkok. Um, you can learn some things in India. But again, I think Thailand is the optimal place to have direct conversations with lots of refugees um, up and down the country, no matter where you are. Not hard to find. Is, is there a dynamic to this, Chris? I mean, I don't remember 
journalists being so at risk in the past. Um, if there are some people out there in these in these um, what do you call them war torn areas uh, that would that would uh, want to kill journalists because they don't want it to be known in the world, and therefore the life of the journalist becomes more risky. Um, am I right to think that this kind of anti-journalism mentality is increasing in our world today? Uh, historically, I think journalists have always been in peril of being targeted. However, in the landscape of psychological warfare that the internet also presents, the last thing any regime wants is to have oppositional images. It damages them, it becomes part of the political pressure on them. So if you are filing, you are considered an enemy of the state. You know, there was a piece on 60 Minutes uh, this past uh, weekend uh, over a, a, a journalist, a photojournalist who took pictures of um, many, many uh, war-torn areas and really powerful images. You know, they say uh, uh, a, a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, that was certainly the case here. And he's he's on exhibit now, I think, in Washington. Um, and it's extraordinary what a photograph can do. But let me let me turn to one last thing I want to ask you about Hawaii. Hawaii in the middle of the ocean. Hawaii, you know, far from where you are in Los Angeles, and certainly far from Southeast Asia. What 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 is the mindset that Hawaii should have about its connection, its awareness uh, about South China Sea, as we have discussed, and and about uh, ASEAN and about um, Myanmar and all the countries around, how aware should we be and why? Well, first and foremost, um, Hawaii is at the center of the, uh, the the deep Pacific, and you've got um, a lot of uh, uh, folks from Southeast Asia and Asia as your neighbors in Hawaii um, with relatives back home um, across Southeast Asia and um, East Asia, first and foremost. Secondly, uh, they're your neighbors. Uh, the Pacific community, the Blue Continent, if you will, and ASEAN, uh, are all interconnected. Through growing up in California, I think my neighbor is Mexico, just down the road. Uh, when actually, if I look at the Pacific from here, there's a lot of uh, friends, allies, neighbors, all kinds of folks uh, that we should view and engage with as a as, as a broader Pacific uh, community, if you will. And Hawaii has a great place to bridge that as the east winters uh, east west center can uh, can attest to so i think you've got a lot of good intellectual institutions like uh manoa and the east west center who can facilitate more conversations on this to begin with also um indo paycom was just doing uh, amazing levels of engagement at the balakatan exercises in the philippines i don't think exercises have been held like this of this scale for the philippines and the u.s um, in a very long time, if ever, I can check some of the uh, number of trucks and personnel. But that's another key factor: is Hawaii as Indo Paycom. This is this is your sphere of influence, and anyone who's working within Indo Paycom or might be recruited to it is going to face some of these conflicts potentially. Hopefully, not Myanmar. Um, Myanmar is very perilous terrain, and everyone is armed to the teeth. Hmm. And yeah, so, so what about the APCSS in Waikiki, uh, the Daniel K. and OA APCSS? Uh, what, what role could they play? You've named a number of institutions here which okay. are relevant and should, should follow this and help us understand them. What about them? Um, put people in the field. Fly them out to Thailand immediately. Start talking to the refugees. Talk to the UN um, right there in Bangkok. Very simple to do. It's not expensive to fly out there and field your people on the border go to the checkpoints um, get permission to come in um, as an observer that's not easy to do but you need to be in the field you can't rely on news sources or the internet to completely inform you i think that's uh that's that that's something that can be done and should be done more aggressively and individual citizens lawyers doctors nurses there's many ways to volunteer um for refugees yeah without and without the, without risking your life without risking your life, and they will tell you their personal story. Mm. And they'll tell you what happened to their town or their village or uh, whatever they're experiencing. I met a few from uh, the capital city, Yangon, who are just, uh, you know, they're waitresses, their brother or sister has already gotten over here, and so they're just bringing relatives over, and they're gonna stay in Thailand for the duration. So they're gonna get, they're gonna save money working in hospitality and go to their education in Thailand, and they're not gonna go home until the Tatmadaw's gone, which is 
um, not going to be easy to do. And to write it up. And to write it up for the media here in Hawaii. We want people to know about this so yeah. they can feel part of the, the Pacific community, including um, people who travel there from, say, for example, the East West Center and, and are on the ground and can report back to us. No? Yeah. Um, you know, a, a lot of us do different kinds of uh, travel. Travel can be very expensive. Uh, but as long as you are going there, also teachers can go. I think teachers can maybe take their summertime. <laughs> teachers are saying, I'm not paid enough to fly. Okay. But uh, finding ways to send over students and teachers so they can observe, chat, and figure out some solutions, some development solutions for the refugees, whether they're in Thailand, Bangladesh, India, or Laos. That's the way forward. Um, arming, arming guerrilla groups uh, is going to be, it, it will just make more bodies. Even though I think there's justice for that, that, that should be done. You know, one last thing is uh, you're a journalist, you're an independent journalist, and you're, you're built out of strong stuff to do what you do and write what you write. Um, but I'm, I'm wondering about the, the program, journalist, journalism program in the communications department here at UH Manoa. You know, you're kind of a product of UH Manoa in many ways. And, and I wonder what you think about um, that kind of journalism, international journalism independent journalism, journalism around the world, and especially in places like um, the places we've been talking about right now. Um, what kind of a career does that offer a young student who would like to be a journalist? Would you recommend it? What, what, would you, would you um, set out specifications for this person to be adequately prepared and, you know, psychologically and in terms of skill? Um, what are your thoughts about people going into the field, your field? Uh, local journalism is increasingly harder to do because there's fewer outlets. So in many ways, you need to be entrepreneurial. Um, international journalism requires more time and patience. So you do need to travel, and that's that cannot always be cheap. So you need to plan more and take your time if you really want to travel and report outside the United States. But there are other outlets. You've got uh, Der Spiegel in Germany. You've got The Guardian in the UK. Um, you've got a lot of small local papers like the Bangkok Post or Asia's most widely read English publication, the South China Morning Post, who I occasionally contribute with. Uh, you've got Nikkei Asia. You've got Bloomberg. You've got a lot of other um, regionally sourced publications. Singapore is a big media hub as well. Uh, I think you need to learn some foreign languages, though, and you'll have competition because a lot of these foreign countries, the kids there study English. And you're, uh, unless you grew up speaking, Thai or um, Vietnamese, you're going to have a learning curve trying to report on these countries effectively and, and with depth. Yeah, you so, speak a bunch of languages, don't you? So if uh, I want to connect up with Der Spiegel, what do I do? I write him a letter and say, uh, my name is Jay Fidel. I'd like to write some stuff for you. How do I do that? Um, I would call their offices in Hamburg and speak to their national. Uh, I'm old fashioned. I get things done by e e emails can work, but thousands and thousands of emails a day and they'll say please no calls but i'm sorry that's what journalists do is you make phone calls and phone calls and phone calls and if you can get through an editor uh that's how you do it say <laughs> I'm, i just came back from Laos. i've got some interesting pictures i spoke with a few pe people here's my pitch and they'll they might say great pitch no not interested Call, and hang up uh when i was starting jay in uh 2000 i was a graduate student at uh manoa and I pitched a travel story on Indonesia to the LA Times, and they said, no, not interested. And then they emailed me back six months later, said, oh, do you have that travel story? We'll take it. <laughs> it took them a while to make a decision about it. So the other thing I wanted to ask you, sorry, one last question. Oh, forgive happy. me, Chris. Um, is, uh, you know, we live in a world of um, technology. For example, over the past uh, the years of COVID, if you will, we have you know, the explosion of Zoom uh, and and connections like this and discussions like this, which I would not otherwise be able to have with you, except sure. when you're here. And um, so, so this should affect journalism if I can get hold of somebody who can yeah. interact with me on Zoom. And the second question I put to you in the same vein is: uh, over the past few months, we have seen the explosion of AI with all these products where you can do research and even writing. And I can put in some bare facts into um, ChatGBT and tell it to write a story for me. 
It won't be perfect, but it's close and it saves me hours of writing. Uh, how does this affect things? So technology is on your doorstep, isn't it? Using Zoom um, for the past two years, I think, um, has set a precedent where this is actually in many ways um, a future for journalism without question. And we should use it because AI cannot replicate what we do. Um, it can write a story, but that doesn't mean you have any context. It doesn't mean it's choosing carefully. Um, editors who are clever can use it to curate things for facts and fact finding. That, 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 that can be helpful, but that's just basically an advanced search engine. But having something write content for you, I think savvier, uh, savvier consumers will not like that. And they won't accept it and they won't pay for it. But free news, maybe you can get more free news out of that. Maybe that's helpful. Yeah, and, and editors can use all those AI programs that identify what what writing is AI writing. So they know when, when you've used AI to generate your, your text. <laughs> uh, AI cannot replicate live interviews a, right now. AI cannot conduct an interview and prove that you did it in a, in a court of law. The court of law will say, well, who was your source? Yeah, um, what did they really say, right? Also, what if people are misquoted on the internet and you use those misquotes, you are liable, <laughs> you're, 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 you're busted. That wasn't that, that something that was scooped out of a chat room, right? Or was said that was, you know, changed. I've had people say, can you please change my comment? So well, you said it on record, but okay, I will go back onto the internet and change your comment. If we'll, that'll make you feel better, you misspoke. Uh, someone today just sent me something, and then five minutes later said, "Oh, I'm sorry. Can I send you the revision?" I said, "No problem. <laughs> it's okay. I can do this." Uh, you'll have a lot more errors with this if you use it like that. So if you blend the two with a bit of research with live interviews, you might have some uh, some good weapons to build more context. But people want to know from the horse's mouth, if you will. Who did you talk to? What really happened? Um, and certainly you're not going to see this in reputable journals and like newspapers are not going to say, oh yeah, a story made by Chat ChatGPT, you, you, you get subscriptions canceled. This raises the issue about that case that's pending in the United States Supreme Court over the New York Times ruling a couple of decades ago, which, which held that um, if a person is a public figure, um, you know, uh, your level of diligence is not the same as if he is not a public figure. Um, and it exposes, you know, if, if, if you reverse that, um, then there's going to be more claims by public figures um, against media. Um, this, and a lot of people in, in journalism are concerned that the Supreme Court is going to reverse that case, uh, thus allowing all kinds of new litigation against it. Uh, the you know the newspapers of our country and for that matter all media in our country. Any thoughts about that? Anything that uh, uh, allows politicians to disguise, change, and be non-transparent is a bad thing. <laughs> Bluntly put, uh, anything that allows them to hide uh, that what they're doing and not be transparent should be opposed uh, on on all levels. It's bad for society. It's bad for democracy. I, I have a wonderful way to put it. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Chris Cottrell uh, in Los Angeles right now, but I'm sure he'll be in Hawaii soon. And I look forward to seeing him again. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you, Jay. And thank you for your uh, viewers there in Hawaii and around the world. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.